I'm not used to the microphone, so, uh, which is organized by the Department of Political Science and International Relations, State University. Uh, this lecture is the second in kind. Uh, we try to, uh, to, to invite prestigious scholars from foreign universities. And today our guest is uh, Professor Thomas Zalfeld from Bamberg University. Uh, Thomas is a professor of political science and he is the founding director of the prestigious Bamberg Graduate School of uh, Social Sciences. Uh, previously, uh, he, was, he, had, he held various academic positions at the University of Kent, University of Hull, and also University of Dresden. He is a member of the advisory board of Italian political science and fellow of academic, Academy of Social Sciences and fellow of the Society of Arts, both based in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Thomas's research interests include uh, representation, as indicated by the title of uh, today's uh, talk, Immigration and Parliamentary Representation in West European Democracies. But Thomas has also worked on uh, different areas, such as legislative behavior, parliamentary accountability, and especially coalition government in European democracies. Uh, he has published his research results extensively in prestigious uh, journals such as European Journal of Political Research, International Studies Quarterly, Journal of Legislative Studies, Parliamentary Affairs, and West European Politics. Uh, in addition to all these intellectual achievements, I also need to add that uh, Thomas is an expert on British higher educational bureaucracy. Uh, at the time when we were at, at the University of Kent, he was our uh, coordinator for RAE, uh, teaching quality assessment, and he has survived hundred and thousand and one uh, audits, reviews, appraisals, uh, evaluations, you name it. So he's a genuine veteran of university red tape if you want to acquire some experience, if you want to benefit from his experience on that field, you should definitely intercept him after this talk. Uh, I also need to add, uh, uh, Thomas has a strong connection uh, to Turkey. In two consecutive years, uh, he was uh, a visiting professor at the summer school of Boğaziçi University, Bosporus University. And he has traveled extensively in Turkey he has seen places that we have, we are yet to visit and see. So allow me to uh, call him to the, so Thomas, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me first say how pleased I am, how delighted I am to be here, to be invited to this uh, uh, important event uh, in your in your calendar. Um, and uh, thanks uh, to Ersun Kurtulush for his very kind words. Um, uh, I'm uh, going to speak about something that is, I think is of great substantive importance to uh, most European democracies, to most democracies. And it also is uh, part of a research project that I'm uh, currently involved in. Um, you see the title. Um, and um, I will start by uh, uh, subjecting you to some conceptual clarifications because it is simply necessary to do that. So why, uh, when I go back to the title, immigration and parliamentary representation in West European democracies, why uh, is representation interesting? So why representation? Now what is representation? Um, um, well, or let me start more generally. Um, representation is a key organizing principle for uh, legitimizing collective choices, collective decisions in larger scale societies. It means, uh, and I'm referring to a very famous classical uh, definition by Hannah Pitkin, uh, representation means representation, the making present again. Representation taken generally means the making presence in some sense of something which is nevertheless not present, literally or in fact. Uh, of course, uh, then she goes on and 
writes a whole book about the notion of representation, the concept of representation in politics. Um, so this is where we start from. Um, now, um, there are some normative problems involved in studying representation. Um, Pitkin, when she wrote about representation in this, um, in this definition, she meant what she later referred to as substantive representation. That is, um, the um, conversion of popular preferences, of uh, interests, if you like, of um, desires articulated by democratic citizens to, into policies. And this substantive representation um, um, is based on the question to what extent are the representatives' activities, for example, the activities of members of parliament, responsive to the preferences of the represented. She calls that acting for. To what extent are parliamentarians acting for us, the citizens of our respective countries? Now this is very problematic. We all know criticisms of politics of being detached, of being out of touch, of being unresponsive. On the other hand, do we want politicians that are overly responsive, that simply follow public opinion? Uh, probably we don't, because in that case we wouldn't have choices between politicians. Um, we would simply have um, 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 politicians running after opinion polls. So there's a difficult trade-off. On the one hand, we want our politicians to be responsive, that is, to, uh, to, to take notice of what we as citizens want and then uh, transfer this into some kind, kind of public policy. This is the whole point of elections. On the other hand, we want choices. We want to make choices between uh, different types of politicians with a different menu of policies, and if that's the case, they cannot be overly responsive. They have to stand so for something. So they are very different, difficult um, trade-offs to make. Um, now this kind of, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping back, this kind of representation is completely irrespective of the representative. The, rep the personality of the representative doesn't matter. I will speak about this a little bit later. The, the representative is simply motivated either by his own drives, by his or her own drives, or by their, by electoral incentives, that is the desire to get reelected. Um, now there's another dimension to representation that will be important to my talk. And that refers to descriptive representation. And here the question is to what extent does the composition of a representative body, for example, a parliament, reflect the composition of the population, uh, namely that the population it claims to represent. And that is what Pitkin refers to as standing for, as opposed to acting for. Does it matter to women whether there are any women in parliament? You could argue, well, if the electoral incentives are right, if women <laughs> use their vote, then it doesn't really matter whether their representatives are male or female, they will be responsive if they want to get re-elected. Does it matter whether blacks are in um, legisl represented in legislatures if you have a large black population? Um, does it matter whether citizens of immigrant origin, for example, uh, uh, German citizens of Turkish origin are represented in the German Bundestag? Or could they, or could their interests be represented by anybody else? Um, we don't know, is the answer. Uh, but this is uh, part of the research that uh, uh, I'm uh, going to talk about. Uh, that is, um, the, the research is still ongoing. We're still collecting data. I will talk a little bit about that project and the data collection. So just, um, just in case you're interested in the data, they will be freely available from next year onwards. Now, why? If, represent if representation is problematic, why do we do it in the first place? Why, why do we use um, uh, representation? Now, um, I'm using here a diagram that I uh, took from uh, Giovanni Sartori's book on democratic theory, and he argues uh, uh, that the, um, that the um, number of participants in a decision has two types of consequences. The larger the number, the higher the decision-making. 
we are if we live in a even in a even if a small community in a university of a few hundred professors um, making decisions unanimously gets quite difficult quite quickly at the same time uh, so so decision making costs increase uh, if, uh, as the number of people involved in decisions increase uh, so uh, a full participation of all citizens in all matters of public concern may not be very practical um, at the same time um, there's an, an uh, uh, another curve that uh, has a very different course and this uh, this curve is uh, the external risk of being affected by a decision without having a say so uh, if uh, a single dictator can make a decision for all that is very efficient in terms of uh, decision making costs but it is it may have massive external costs for everybody else except that dictator uh, which means you have a trade-off between two different um, dimensions and Sartori believes that there's some kind of an equilibrium um, uh, 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 a, s a suitable number of representatives uh, that repre number of representatives is relatively small I put here 10 on the scale I think I've taken this from Sartori but that's just a notional number <coughs> has no particular meaning so representation is meant to be a, a limit uh, an, uh, something that constrains decision-making costs without uh, allowing the um, external costs, the external risks of, uh, for those affected by the decisions to spiral out of control. That's why we do this, basically. That's why it's necessary. Um, now, uh, this representation as we know it in Western democracies is based on a number of pre premises. It's premised on citizenship. The question, who gets to elect representatives? who is represented. As you know, uh, in my own country, Germany, um, there had have been very restrictive laws of, of naturalization for a very long time, which means there was a very large non-national uh, population in the country that was affected by all decisions, had, high, had massive external risks to speak in Satori's language, but was not did not have any chances to influence that decision. So citizenship is important. Uh, representation is usually uh, about territorial, territorial units. In most cases, it's organized around local or regional or national districts. Uh, local districts, think of the United Kingdom's electoral system, 650 odd uh, electoral districts, or think of the Netherlands, where the entire country is one electoral district, and many different uh, notions or uh, sizes um, or constructions in between. There may be groups that have identifiable interests here we're getting closer to uh, for example the interests of immigrants in some cases there are uh, constitutional provisions for group for group representation think for example of Belgium a country uh, that has uh, three minorities the Dutch speaking Flams the French speaking Walloons and a tiny German minority in the east of Belgium um, and uh, all the, the the interests are uh, and the representation of all three groups is safeguarded by the Belgian constitution. Uh, and there are mechanisms for the, I'm sorry about this uh, thing, I don't know where it comes from, but I suspect we cannot do much about it. Um, mechanism for the aggregation of interests. Do we vote? Do we need a quorum, for example, to make decisions about uh, important matters of public concern, etc.? So um, these are important premises, and I would argue that these premises are being challenged, or have been challenged recently. Um, and immigration is part of that story, and this is why I think it's very interesting and it's normatively important for us to deal with it. How then does immigration create a challenge for representation? Well, uh, here we can enter immigration, and, uh, there's a, uh, and I would like to refer to a very large and growing li literature on the so-called deterritorialization of democratic representation. Some authors argue uh, that the modern world is characterized by processes of denationalization with a decreasing congruence between social and political spaces. Political spaces meaning a particular territory, 
social spaces, meaning the number of people and the groups of people living in those territories. There's a decoupling going on, according, for example, to um, uh, Michael Zürn and uh, Walter Drop. Large-scale migration is one expression of this. It creates many new resi residents without citizenship rights. Um, it creates diasporas. It creates groups with dense transactions, as Zürn and Walter Drop say, stretch beyond national borders. Think, for example, of the very strong connections of the uh, communities of Turkish origin in a number of European countries to Turkey, the ancestral homeland. And create it, cr it may create new minorities and political cleavages. In the United Kingdom, there's, uh, the uh, immigrants are not real. When, when they refer to immigrants, they mean Romanians or Poles. When they speak about uh, the first or the second generation of black immigrants from the Caribbean, they speak of ethnic minorities. So, it's, it's, uh, so the, the language has changed, but that has uh, quite, quite important implications for public policy. Um, and that creates new and I think very important normative problems for most liberal democracies. If there are new minorities, there are new, there's an increasing scope for the violation of certain democratic principles. For example, it creates inequalities, for in, in particular the inequality of access to citizenship rights and duties. The exclusion and or the underrepresentation of minorities, the risk of discrimination. And if, if, this, uh, if, if the discrimination, uh, in the initial discrimination uh, translates into the political system and patterns of representation, a perpetuation of discrimination we only need to think of the um, history of the United States until the 1970s. We come to uh, problems of taxation without representation. The risk, perhaps, of a tyranny of the majority against arbit with, a, with arbitrary rule over of minorities. But there could also be, we know this from the United States politics, a, a tyranny of, mi of minorities. For example, we found that the Cuban minority in southern Europe, uh, U.S. states have very strong powers because their preferences are very intense, they're easy to mobilize, and the rest of the population is relatively indifferent, which means that they have actually quite good chances to have their interests um, represented, uh, again, even against majority views. So there are uh, new challenges that, are that we are facing that we didn't face or think about so much until uh, quite recently. Why? Uh, why should we, should we look at parliaments? That's the other notion, that's the other concept in the title of my, my talk. Why should we look at parliaments in this context? Well, it's, uh, I think it's really relatively obvious. Um, in European parliamentary systems of government, members of parliament are the elected representatives. Governments derive their authority from, their, uh, from the parliament. Parliaments, members of parliament make and break governments because there's a confidence relationship between the government and the parliamentary majority. In their attempts to get re-elected, members of parliament pe perform an important linkage function between civil society and state. For example, through their debates, through their working constituencies, through legislation, and of course increasingly through other media, social media. And parliaments, not least parliaments, are the pool from which the political elite of a country are drawn. They're commonly seen as the natural place for representation. Now, uh, what do we know theoretically about it? Um, what kind of uh, key yeah, notions uh, or, or design or research, research or what has shaped what, what kind of thinking, what kind of causal thinking in particular has shaped research about representation so far? Um, I think uh, representation has made research and representation has made very little progress since 1963 when uh, Miller and Stokes um, published their Classical article in which they offer a model. Their question is how do the, the attitudes of the constituents in an electoral district in the US translate into the behavior of the representatives? Does it matter to them? That's why I put a question mark. There's a, there's a, there, the, 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 this relationship is unclear. Do, does, it, does it matter whether somebody, some senator represents a state 
with an, a strong industrial base or agri agri an agricultural base, whether there's a black minority or a, or not a strong black minority or maybe even a black majority, um, whatever it may be. Um, how does, how, how, what is the link? How responsive is the representative uh, in terms of a substantive representation as defined by Pitkin? Now, um, Miller and Stokes have developed a model. The con and, uh, I'm trying to talk you, I'm, I'm trying to ignore the, um, the, the arrows in the middle of the, the diagram, but I will talk about the upper and the lower branches of it. Um, first of all, um, the, they measure, if you go to the very right, they measure the behavior of uh, members of Congress uh, by looking at their roll call behavior. How do they vote? That was a, for, for them, that was a hard and easily to easy to measure in indicator of responsiveness. And constituencies' attitudes, they measured by using surveys and basic sociodemographic properties of the electoral district. Um, if we go to the lower branch and think of a representative who um, wishes to get re-elected by his constituents, he will take note of the uh, constituency's attitude. So he will take into account what the constituents think, and that may, if he feels or she feels vulnerable, electorally influence what they do. Less obvious, perhaps, is the upper branch, uh, because how would the constituency's attitude shape the representative's attitude? Well, um, the idea is that there's an election going on, and the constituents will select an, a, a representative that is relatively similar to them, that shares their views in, a, in, a, in an electoral campaign. Every, uh, every candidate will present a policy platform, and the constituents, that's the assumption, will select somebody, elect somebody that is closest to their own views. So in that sense, there's a link between the two. Uh, what you can see here is therefore um, the, uh, for the, the personal characteristics of members of parliament or of Congress are assumed here to be irrelevant, and that's a critical point. Political parties, and that's even worse, are completely ignored. That is, bad for, uh, that, that is bad for the United States because political parties do matter, but it's even worse for Europe where we have a very strong role of political parties. Institutions are ignored. Well, uh, the excuse for Miller, Miller and Stokes is, of course, that they operated, uh, the studies that they conducted operated in one particular constant institutional context, so they didn't have to worry too much about this. We, of course, when we look at across Europe, we have uh, a lot of different institutional um, configurations that matter. And there's a very strong focus on the electoral incentives only. No, for note that questions of identity, of, 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 of the, of the uh, particularly in co re relevant in our context, are um, virtually completely absent. If we want to translate this to uh, a European context, and I apologize when I copied this into this set of slides, this didn't come across very well, um, we need to uh, add a number of things. I think at least three, three dimensions. We need to uh, think about electoral institutions, electoral systems. For example, an electoral system that creates very strong incentives to cultivate a personal vote may matter, may make the, the personality of the representative or the candidate much more important. Think of the British first-past-the-post system with, uh, where, where, where there's a relatively strong candidate focus. Uh, that may ma the, the, person, the personality of the member of parliament may matter less in the Dutch political system where the entire country is one district, there's a list system, and you simply uh, tick, uh, may make your cross at, at, the na at, at, a, at a party list. Um, the, um, the other set of institutions that matters, institutional rules, how free are MPs if they get elected to express their constituents' attitudes. They can be extremely constrained if you think you can stand up in the German Bundestag and say something that is ridiculous. You will have to ask your party. You will, uh, the, the party will decide, and the, the party's rights are enshrined in the standing orders of the Constitution, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the Bundestag. And there may be additional party rules. Parties may have additional rules to the constitutional and legal rules that exist anyway. So we have to consider these uh, questions far more strongly than Miller and Stokes had to when we, um, think about representation in a 
in a non-American context, but I'd suggest we also have to think about it in the US context. As I said, Mill and Stokes simply didn't have to worry about th this because they operated, their, their study operated within the constant political system. So what about citizens of immigrant origin in this process? Um, now, and what I'm going to present to you now are thoughts about first results. It's very, very tentative of a project that I'm involved in. I'm the coordinator of this project. Um, it is a joint project with Manlio Ginali from uh, Sciences Po Paris, Laura Morales from the University of Leicester, and Jean Tilly of the University of Amsterdam. It's funded uh, very generously with, and I have to acknowledge that, uh, by uh, under the so-called ORA, Open Research Area Plus scheme, by the French, Dutch, German, and British funding associations. Um, and uh, it's called Pathways, Pathways to Power, the Political Representation of Citizens of Immigrant Origin in European Democracies. Um, we started with seven countries, now we have eight. We have been joined by a Belgium sister project. This is what we cover. For the first time ever, anybody covers Southern Europe in this context, uh, which we're particularly proud of, where well, we were particularly proud of when we applied, and we now see the difficulties um, which uh, arise from, uh, to the, uh, from, from very diff problematic information about the, the, the lack of information, basically, and the lack of digitalization of parliamentary records, because what we do, of course, is we go into the parliamentary debates, for example, and if you do this for a large number of countries, you want to do this um, uh, with com computer assisted, uh, with, with the assistance of computers and when you want to do that and you have photocopies with coffee stains photocopied onto uh, your documents, then you cannot use automated, um, um, uh, automated um, uh, procedures. Okay, so um, we include Belgium, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and the United Kingdom. We, in each case, we include several legislative periods. You can see them here very briefly. And we also cover, which I'm not talking about, the regional level here. Uh, I will, um, parties play a big role in this, but, I will, uh, but for, for those who may be interested in this kind of area, we, we look at descriptive representation and substantive representation on the right. We look at who is represented in parliament. It, uh, again, this is, uh, we, uh, this is not a trivial task because we don't use some kind of a racial or ethnic definition of representatives. I will talk about our definition in a moment. So it's quite difficult to track, for example, parents of, um, of pe people who were born in Germany or in Belgium or in France, but who, who immigrated uh, from a different country. Uh, and it's, th this gets particularly difficult in the case of mothers. Um, so it's, it's a lot of hard work. If, we go, if we're looking at thousands and thousands of biographies and trying to figure out where the, the, the parents of, um, of these uh, uh, mem members of parliament came from, um, we look very carefully at various aspects of political parties because we think they play us, um, t um, a, 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 an important role. We look at um, constituency demographics. We look at the, the institutional context, the policy context. We look at the structure of pol uh, public opinion in the countries. We look at anti-immigrant mobilization as a contextual factor and also um, pro-immigrant mobilization from immigrant organizations. So we collect data on all that. Uh, and it will be a very rich um, uh, data set with a lot of original data, especially on descriptive and substantive representation on the right. So that's only very shortly. Uh, how do we, uh, what, who are, am I going to speak about when I speak about an immigrant or somebody of immigrant origin? Um, any individual that was either born abroad as a foreign national that we call, often refer to as the first generation or have or has um, one parent of foreign nationality at birth, and that would be the second generation. Uh, which is, imp uh, this, this does not, over uh, this, this, this definition overlaps, but it doesn't overlap fully with immigrants, because we, we capture the children of immigrants who may be, um, who, who may be uh, naturalized. And it also isn't, uh, isn't uh, re uh, uh, restricted to ethnic minorities or what some people could, could uh, would call visible minorities. So we don't identify people by their name um, or by, by, their, by their pictures. Um, uh, in, in our case, uh, the Austrian who migrated to Germany is, a, is an immigrant, uh, as well as the person of Turkish origin. Uh, we have additional variables that then filter out whether somebody could be recognized by their name or by their, by th by their skin color or by the, the things they wear, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, but for, for our purposes, we find this the most uh, acceptable definition. How many people were born abroad in, in European countries? I give you, uh, this ranges from well over thir one third in Luxembourg to 1% in Romania um, and everything in between. The median in the European Union of 27, that is without Croatia in 2011 was um, 11%. 11% of all people in, in the European Union are immigrants themselves. With, uh, with some countries like um, uh, Luxembourg or Cyprus or Latvia, um, uh, Estonia, uh, quite high. Latvia and Estonia, of course, because the Russians were living in these countries. Um, what about representation? How many first-generation immigrants made it into the national parliaments? Well, in our, ca in our case, it, we, we look at, we, we have data for here seven countries, the Netherlands, the UK, Greece, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy, and you can see between 9%, uh, to just under 10% in the Netherlands to yeah, barely 2% in Italy. If you plot this somehow, you can see um, uh, on the horizontal axis the foreign-born population, and on the vertical axis the foreign-born MPs, you get some kind of an interesting puzzle. A, there's, a, there's real cross-national variation. In the Netherlands, the, in the, Netherlands uh, in, the p in the second chamber of the Dutch Parliament, there are more citizens of s more immigrants than in the population. Immigrants are overrepresented in the Netherlands. In the UK, they are slightly overrepresented. In Greece, they are more or less as expected. In Italy and in Spain, they are uh, uh, they're clearly below that. Don't take this for a regression line, but some kind of an indication. Um, 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 they're, they're clearly underrepresented. So, uh, so A, why is that gap? And b wha what, what causes that gap? And B, why is it different? Why, why is the, are the Netherlands so different, for example, for, uh, the, um, uh, from, from, from Italy or Spain? So these are the two uh, thi things that, we, uh, that, we, uh, that, that I'm going to talk about in the, in the rest of the, the remainder of, the, of this talk. Now, what explanations do we have? Well, there are, I think, uh, th in the literature, there's been this not very sort of original but uh, youthful uh, uh, distinction between three types of factors. One is supply, the supply side factors. There is an insufficient supply of candidates. And that could have a variety of reasons. Um, if, you're, if people are immigrants, they're not familiar with the new country of residence, they don't speak the language, they may have not have the appropriate qualifications, uh, they may not be interested in the country of residence and its politics, but may still have strong connections to their homeland. They may be culturally apathetic, that is uh, some uh, stereotype that is often uh, uh, used against Chinese. Um, in, uh, or they may simply be rational and say, well, I, I don't stand a chance anyway, so I'm not going to even, going, even going to try. Uh, th so those would be typical, so not, not, in a, not enough candidates, basically. The, the demand side would be the other side of the story, basically, uh, that the autochthonous population is skeptical or even racist. There could be xenophobia um, in, with in the electorate or in political parties. Parties may fear the electoral risk of nominating candidates that are visibly different and therefore might be an electoral liability. Um, there may be uh, um, a preponderance of parties in the, legis in the national legislature that do not want a great deal of participation and inclusion of immigrants. Uh, we have a number of parliaments in the European Union where conservative parties have held uh, a majority for a very long time or have been strong enough to block every attempt to, to make reforms. And there might be structures. Uh, structurally, uh, the structures, I would, uh, my definition of structure is if it's exogenous, if, if, if this is some, some structural factor that cannot be easily influenced by, by politicians in the country. The type of immigration, uh, for example, um, is, it, um, is, it, um, is it immigration, for example, from a country's colonies uh, where the immigrants typically speak the language, typically have privileged um, uh, channels to acquire citizenship quite quickly, or is it a very different type of um, immigration? <coughs> and um, 
the, the, so that, that relates also to the colonial traditions and past def dependent definitions of citizenship. I will talk about that. So the, sit the, no the, 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 the way we define ourselves, our national identity, may vary very strongly. Um, the, 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 uh, and this, this may go back for a long time, for example. It is, uh, that was argued by Rogers Brubaker and others that the Germans, um, uh, when they became a, a state again, a nation state in the 1860s and 70s, had to define themselves culturally and couldn't define themselves politically like the French. Um, and therefore, um, uh, the, the, the cultural, yeah, the, 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 the cultural and but also the, the ethnic uh, belonging to the German state, um, to, 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 to Germandom uh, or whatever, um, may, 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 be, may be crucial, whereas that may not have been the case in other countries. Okay. Um, how convincing are supply side arguments? Well, um, what are the expectations? Well, I, 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 I won't g t talk you through a large number of statistics. We know that the political interest of citizens of immigrant origin tends to be lower, but the gap between the autochthonous and the allochthonous population is narrowing because the autochthonous population gets less and less interested in politics. So we, we, we know that. We know that um, ca uh, we have fewer candidates from, uh, from of immigrant origin. Uh, but whatever we, uh, we, we, we can say about the first generation, we would expect with a good immigration integration policies that this gap between the first generation and the second generation, uh, the, 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 that this gap between the, between the immigrant origin population and the, and the, uh, the non-immigrant origin population should shrink with the second and third generations. Uh, I think that, that is a very simple uh, test um, and, and because uh, the second generation of immigrants tend to, or immigrant origin citizens tends to be more similar to the, to, to, to the, to the, to the regular, in inverted commas, population. But what we see is, uh, this, is th this, this is not e good, this is not easy to read here, um, is uh, that this gap still persists. Um, the representational gap persists. Um, the, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, uh, if we include first and second generation citizens of immigrant origin, um, uh, there are, uh, there in the last parliament, 13% of all MPs were of immigrant origin as, as opposed to about 10% if you only include the first generation. Uh, the Netherlands are st st still by far the best performer. The UK, which was low but above average here, uh, the UK uh, seems to have done a good job of integrating and mobilizing second generation immigrants who then, if, if you include second generation Im immigrants, make up a, a approximately, first and second generation make up approximately 11% of all members of parliament between 2010 and 2015. Um, so always look at the, at the dark blue bars. But if you look at other countries, the only other country that sort of has a reasonable record may be, may be Belgium on the left, which has sort of six to seven percent of uh, citizens of immigrant origin if you take the first and second generation. Uh, the southern Europeans fail miserably, although Spain, for example, has a very large immigrant population, and the Germans and French are not doing very well either. Um, the, the light blue bars are, the, uh, uh, again, the uh, percentage of, um, of uh, first generation immigrants um, in the population. We don't have any reliable statistics on first plus second generation uh, immigrants in, in the population, so um, we're using the first um, the first um, um, generation uh, for for the population data here. Okay, uh, po point, but the point is the gap doesn't go because with, with with one exception, the United Kingdom, the gap does not close. So there isn't really uh, the the kind of disadvantages that you would expect first generation immigrants to have: poor language skills. Uh, lack of familiarity, attachment to homeland politics, all of these things um, are much weaker. We know this from, from a, a, a huge amount of surveys. Uh, nevertheless, you have that gap in all countries um, um, except uh, the, uh, the, the, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. So um, what I'm, um, what I'm the, next, the next point then would be what um, the, the what other factors are available? I already, already mentioned them. Uh, structural factors, perhaps, um, and, um, and um, demand side factors. I'm talking a little bit, very briefly and superficially, about the structural factors first. And I'm comparing two countries here. 
um, the UK and Germany. Uh, the UK had labor migration from the 1950s, labor migration from its former colonies, particularly from the Caribbeans, from Jamaica, from Barbados, from Trinidad and Tobago, countries like that. In the 60s, uh, this, uh, this, this relatively strong inflow of immigrants was supplemented by uh, South Asian refugees from Africa. When um, Kenya, Tanzania, other African, Uganda, other, other African um, countries uh, achieved their independence, the, Im the Indian minority that was brought there by the British colonizers um, usually had to leave the country in very large numbers. Um, so we had migration, uh, but migration from former colonies, and these citizens spoke English, maybe not perfect English, but they spoke English, and they had British citizenship from the start, from the first day. They could vote and they could stand for elections. So they could participate in the political process. In Germany, if you contrast that, after, uh, until 1961, Germany's immigration was uh, a need for immigration. Labor market was taken care of by refugees, German refugees, either from East Germany or from Russia or from or Soviet Union or from Poland or from uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. From 19 six in 1961, the war was built, the Iron Curtain fell completely, uh, and the German government started to uh, recruit actively in Southern Europe and, of course, also in Turkey. Um, usually, um, the, uh, there were agreements with the governments. There were the, and the, the notion, of the, 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 the idea was there would, there would, would be a guest worker. The, word, the, the part guest shouldn't be over over emphasized here. Uh, these uh, men usually uh, who worked in the mines or in, uh, in, the, in industry, in chemical industry, etc., were uh, expected to work in Germany for five to ten years and then uh, return and be replaced by new young blood, as it were. They so there, there was no idea, there was no, no notion that these people should be become citizens and participants. Uh, that that was simply not the case. Um, and uh, that was um, that was reinforced by relatively, uh, that's my second point on the right, uh, strict uh, re restrictive citizenship laws, which were tied to what is referred to as the Jus Sanguinis, the law of the blood. Um, you acquire citizenship by your ancestry, and not um, even if it's f quite remote. Um, um, if it, but 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 that is how you acquire your your your, your citizenship. Uh, you, uh, and that, that principle obtained from 1913 uh, in imperial times until uh, 2000, basically. Um, and it's been watered down a little bit in 2000, but not completely removed, as, as you know. <laughs> um, uh, whereas uh, the UK had the Usoli tradition, when if you were born on British soil, you become a British citizen automatically. Um, so again, that, that facilitated the incorporation of the second generation, hugely, whereas uh, the second generation of children who were born um, uh, as, 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 as the children of Turkish immigrants, they remained Turks and not citizens. And it was still a, <coughs> a complicated process for them to acquire citizenship. However, I don't think these, are th th these structural longer term factors are so important. Um, France has a very similar tradition to, to, to the United Kingdom and hasn't done as well as the United Kingdom in incorporating the second generation. Um, France is a typical, the typical use solely country in Europe or was for a long time. Um, and, and the Germans showed suddenly in 1999, 2000, you can't change things. Uh, quite quickly, and all the talk about, uh, about uh, uh, identity and, and the constitution um, seemed to be, uh, um, it had to be watered down because there was strong resistance. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but the, the, this, this massive change in 2000 shows that um, these structural longer term factors are not God given, they're not exogenous, uh, politicians can change them, which is why I'm suggesting to focus on the politicians and not <laughs> on, on, on the structures. Uh, and this, um, and this, this is my, this is my, my third explanation, the, sub the demand side. Um, and the demand, if you want to understand the demand side in Germany, you have to look at the parties. And for, uh, not just in Germany, also in, in, in Europe. Uh, again, the quality is not very good. We have many countries, many elections, and we are, will when we, as the, prog the Pathways progress, uh, Project progresses, we will find better ways of, of visualizing data. Uh, but you, the, 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 the yellow bars are um, the percentage of immigrant origin M MPs and, um, uh, in, 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 
in, um, I think, in left-wing parties, in center-left parties and left-wing parties. That is, uh, if you go to, for example, to Belgium, to the first, uh, to the first, the, the, the most left-wing column, 92% of all immigrant origin MPs in Belgium were members, were elected for a left-wing party. And only 8% not for a left-wing party. And um, this is despite the fact that left-wing parties only had 29% of the, of, the, of the MPs in our sample in, in that period. So that shows, and, and, and that, that preponderance of, um, strong preponderance in, in Belgium, but also in Germany, also in Italy, also in, in, in the Netherlands, also in the United Kingdom, is quite, a strong, is quite a strong indication that political parties make choices, they can put forward candidates, and if they do, they also have a chance to get elected. So uh, that is uh, simply a first indication. Um, a second indication is, um, uh, uh, this is only Germany, and again, it's a bit of a weird diagram. These are the positions of the political parties uh, about immigration um, in all election manifestos from 1949 to 2013. Well, how do we, did we find that out? We use simply use the uh, uh, a, cer a certain number of codes of the so-called comparative manifesto project, which is a a, um, a research project, a, a large, uh, very ambitious international research project that codes um, uh, uh, policy positions um, um, from election manifestos for all parties represented in parliament. And you, what, what you can see is here very minor oscillations for the 40s, 50s, and 1960s. Uh, the Christian Democrats were blue, that are blue here uh, were always more to the restrictive pole, and the liberals in, the, in that time were more open, were, for, were, were advocated easier access to citizenship, um, um, easier access to permanent residence, and things like that. And you can see how far out the Christian Democrats went in from the 1980s <coughs> onwards. They really became an anti-immigration party until around about 2005. Uh, and if you know anything about German politics, you know that the Christian Democratic Party is the dominant party. Even if they're not in government, they will still be powerful enough to block, given the Constitution, quite a lot of policy proposals, um, for example, of the Red-Green government of, of, of 1998 to 2005 in the Second Chamber or in, a, in, a, in other ways. So you have a, the preponderance of a party that was very, very skeptical of immigration on the one hand, and quite strong polarization in the party system. That is, there were real fights about this. It was a very contentious issue suddenly, in a, in a way that it was not a contentious issue in, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, or other countries. And, but you also can see that from about around about 2002, 2005 onwards, the Christian Democrats moved to the left. There's, uh, and, and this is, in some ways, uh, explains to an extent at least why suddenly in 2000 something became, some movement became possible. Uh, they're still the, uh, the, the, the ones that are the most to the right, and you can see that all po po political parties went further to the right in the most recent elections. But however, this is no longer the, uh, uh, as much of a cause for confrontation as that. So the positions of the parties and the fact, uh, strong polarization, ferocious political competition around the issue of immigration, plus the strongest party in the party system being the most anti-immigrant party, um, uh, in terms of residence rights, in terms of uh, requirements for permanent residence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, shows uh, I think explains something, and I think um, you could probably find similar explanations um, in other countries. We're not as far yet with our analysis, so I'm simply contrasting here uh, a, a few cases. And again, Germany, um, why why were p uh, why are for example, right-wing political parties are a little bit more relaxed about this nowadays. I think it's driven by public opinion to a large extent. What you see here, the rising, the two rising lines are two s uh, statements. In the Albus, it's a, it's, a, it's a population survey, very representative social science uh, um, uh, population survey, which goes into the ISSP surveys. Um, um, two statements. Uh, foreigners should leave the country when jobs are scarce, agree, that's the dark dotted line. Um, uh, it goes uh, no, th th sorry. That, that's the that's the that's the that's the the, the red. Um, yeah, there's something wrong here. Um, 
let me just read my, my own slides. Um, the, the people who disagreed with the statement, sorry, that foreigners should leave, go up. It goes up from 20% to over 50, well, well over 50%. The people who disagree with the statements that foreigners should be prohibited from political activity, that, that the people, only 25% of Germans disagreed with this statement in 1980. And uh, nowadays it's around almost 60% who disagree with this. And people who um, disagree, um, so, so the, the acceptance of, um, of immigrants um, has increased, has improved. Um, um, and um, therefore, it is less risky and less beneficial for political parties to have these uh, such a hardline anti-immigrant stance. I th uh, so, um, so on the whole, the, 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 the climate of public opinion has <laughs> improved significantly. <coughs> so m to, to sum this up a little bit, is I think a lot of the answers for the differences between the countries, and I haven't shown this conclusively here with the data because we are beginning to see our data at the moment, the, the, but if, you, if I'm contrasting the Netherlands and the UK and Germany as examples, as extreme cases perhaps, um, uh, structural factors not very, uh, not particularly convincing. Um, supply side factors not particularly convincing except in the United Kingdom. Uh, factors that relate to the demands, uh, the, that is demand for or acceptance of um, immigrants uh, or immigrant origin citizens as representatives, um, public opinion improves the position of the political parties becomes more pro-immigrant, if you like. And um, um, uh, so, so the, the, these are, in my, in my view, uh, at least plausible arguments uh, to support the case I'm making. But if you disagree, I would be very interested to hear what, uh, what you think. Does it matter? Does it really matter? Wh does it matter whether somebody is of immigrant origin or not, in, in parliament or not? Um, as I said, if, if you are, um, um, the, the British MP for Brent East, which is um, a constituency where 80% of your constituents will be black. And if you're white, and if you don't articulate black interests, you're not getting re-elected. People know that. You will not even get nominated, re-nominated by your party. So uh, it could well be that there is no difference. How would, how did, uh, uh, and I can't give you very conclusive answers, but I can tell you a little bit how we try to measure that, because I think it's, it's methodologically interesting and quite challenging. We looked for parliamentary speeches, and we realized, and, and the uh, first idea to an analyze speeches of each individual MP using automated procedures. You can't do that with hand coding anymore. Um, we realized speeches, it, it is not possible for individuals to give speeches in some, uh, some parliament. So what we then looked at were parliamentary questions. And uh, when it comes to parliamentary questions, MPs are much freer to articulate what they, what they do. We could, of course, use press releases. That's one another strategy. We could use, um, in so far, the MPs use Twitter and, and, and Facebook, use that kind of information. Uh, but we know that there's a very strong selection bias in the use of these social media. <coughs> so what the, this, the, the, but the, we know that, uh, a, that British MPs, in a single parliamentary term, ask two, 300,000 questions. In the Germany is still 20 or 30,000. In France, similar. In most countries, quite similar. Very large number of, um, uh, of, of questions, a lot of text, a lot of, and the questions aren't just to get information. Um, if, you if you're not allowed to speak, you use the questions also to make your point, to make yourself known, because this is reported in the media at home, back, back home in your district. So you become, uh, you, become um, uh, you, you, you use the parliamentary platform uh, uh, with these ma ma means. So, but what, what we, so what the, our very first step is to, try to get hold of as my as, 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 uh, of all the parliamentary questions in the par in the last term and then to analyze them in um, in some way <coughs> and here we are at the very beginning we initially thought we go straight to topic models and the kind of sentiment analysis the kind of things that computer linguists do we realized very quickly we can't do this across so many languages at the moment we can't even do it in one language because there are many technical problems with these data uh, that I'm not going to talk about um, uh, but uh, the or uh, simply, um, uh, perhaps, um, what we do now is we, we uh, have tried to, to um, define, use a dictionary. This is the method. We use a dictionary with terms like immigrant, asylum, security, uh, etc., to, to, cr to um, 
to create two types of frames. And I don't want to use the word frame too closely to Goffman, or the, uh, but, but more as a, more as a, as a, as a shorthand for co-occurrences of words. So we define two, uh, we've, uh, and one, one uh, by reading thousands of questions for, for the UK, and I'm using the UK example here because all of you can read English. Um, I, can, I think not many people will be able to read Dutch or German. So I'm using the, the, the British, British words here. So we used to, dic we, we found out by reading th those questions, s some members of parliament are really worried about immigrants and they see immigrants as a security and as a um, issue, as a crime issue, as a threat. We try to find then extract words that are quite representative of that kind of sentiment and then looked for other words that occur with those with those words in, in each parliamentary question. And, and we found another type of MP who also asked a lot of questions about immigration, but more in terms of equal opportunities, access to social services, education, access to university, health issues, et cetera, et cetera. So what we created were two frames, one, what the, the, the one that we call rights, equality, and diversity, and the other one, threats of or risks of immigration. And uh, you can see, if you look at these two frames in the UK, it works actually quite well. The left one on the left is the uh, diversity rights and uh, uh, inequality frame where you find ethnic, minority, employ, Asian, um, you find uh, discrimination, identification, universe. We, we had to truncate these words because they can have many different endings. You in, 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 in with, with Turkish are very aware of this, so we had to reduce it to the stem, and therefore they look so funny. Uh, because we, don't, we, we didn't want to measure differences in grammar or something, we wanted to go to the core of the word. Uh, whereas uh, on the right you see the, uh, the, uh, the more sort of uh, the, the, the frame that me was meant to capture the, the threats, the risks of immigration. You see terrorist, illegal case, legal case, uh, sentence, border, um, prison, and all kinds of other sim similar things. So we, we thought, and now well what we did, the next step, we looked whether this, uh, whether, part, whether, whether these, these matter for immigrant or non-immigrant origin politicians controlling for party. And um, the, the message is, um, if uh, we, we created these two frames uh, for, for example, um, how, many how many questions on average did uh, that the first line did a social democratic or socialist MP of immigrant origin and not of immigrant origin um, ask about equality and diversity and about the defensive frame, the risks of immigration. Um, you can see that um, um, on average in, in, in the parliament 2009 to 2013, the immigrant origin MP of the Social Democrats asked about one question about equality and diversity issues and no question. Uh, and and the, the non-immigrant MPs didn't ask any, any question on about this. Um, but if, when it comes to the more defensive frame, it's a bit more mixed. You can see in the United Kingdom, um, uh, the, um, um, the, there's a similar preponderance. Um, and what, what you, the, the bigger picture is, with, with one example, the exception, that's France, that um, si um, in within each party, the immigrant origin politicians are asked more about equality and diversity, less about the risk, and the others are asked more about the risks and less about the uh, equality and diversity. So party matters hugely, but even if you look, if you control for party somehow, and this is only a first step, it's not fancy statistics, I, even if, if you control for party, you find that the immigrants uh, immigrant origin MPs do make a certain difference. They articulate these views more, despite the fact, I even, so even if you hold the party constant. So uh, this leads me to some uh, con tentative conclusions. Um, immigration, as I tried to point out in the beginning, is a normative challenge to a liberal democracy, and it's a growing challenge. It's not an ending challenge. So, uh, in Germany, we have the next, the next lost generation in the country with about one million and we we are hoping that we can integrate their children. We're hoping that, that we can learn a few things from, from past mistakes. Uh, the traditional ways of conceptualizing representation imported from the US need tweak, tweaking to make them more suitable, but they're still uh, useful. Uh, we need to include institutions. We need to include party. 
we find that wh when we look at descriptive representation, a gap in all countries except the, Nether except the Netherlands, and we do not see this gap closing in the second generation except for the United Kingdom. Uh, explanations are, uh, will be complex, uh, and, um, and they are at the moment I don't, didn't give you a good explanation. I simply give, gave you some factors that I think are particularly